dear colleague, I'm happy to say that we can start a little bit. We are late, but it's not, this time not so important because we are going to hear very nice, very good three presentations. And it is about psychosomatic health. It is about the philosophy in medicine, about approach, which is very, very patient-centered and not illness-centered, as we just spoke in press conference. And the first speaker is Dr. Bernhard Palmowski, who is um, the president of um, Berlin, Brandenburg, German Psychosomatic Medicine and Psychotherapy Association, who is board member of Psychosomatic Academy in Berlin, and who is very, very, uh, who has very long experience, I think, 30 years. It's uh, clinical, for clinical experience, good time to say something important for uh, colleagues. So, please, Ben, have your floor, and uh, the name of the presentation, as you see, somatization, somatization. Thank you very much, Gunther, for your kind words, ladies and gentlemen. We will talk about somatization as a challenge for the healthcare system and especially about some clinical aspects. And to begin with, we will go right in media's race. <laughs> I don't know if you have seen this wonderful film, Life of Pi, where a young man meets a tiger in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a lifeboat after being shipwrecked. And what you see, this young man is facing the tiger. He's looking into the tiger's eyes, and he is, in the course of time, discovering the animal and even befriending the animal. And this, what he's doing, is a patient with somatization not able to. He is not able to face the threat, to face the danger, and to discover what it is all about. So we have kind of a two-step pathogenesis, basically. The first step in the pathogenesis of a somatization disorder is cutting off the experience from its context, isolating the experience from its context, and instead concentrating on my own reaction. Not on the threat, but concentrating on my own reaction, the heart pounding, my breath, the tension in the abdominal wall, the bowel movements, the urgency, the sweating. I concentrate on all that, but not on the real existing danger. So this is basically the principle of pathogenesis. Uh, the subsequent product of these processes is what we call functional somatic syndromes. And we have to keep in mind that in functional somatic syndromes or somatization disorders, the, the guiding symptom is a somatic symptom. And the definition says the organ function, what the organ should do and deliver to me, is not working but we have no structural damage so far. Under the microscope or in the section table, we have no objective findings. Also, the organ is not working properly. But still, still, the patient suffers on the physical, somatic, bodily level. And that's a very important issue in dealing with these patients. I have to say some words about the nomenclature there is a plethora of different words for describing this problem. A quite unfortunate term to me is medically unexplained symptoms because medicine mustn't stop short before these symptoms or organ neurosis, psychogenic syndrome, and so on. Complex somatic symptom disorder are the somewhat confusing terms. And the best term, in my opinion, is functional somatic syndrome because it describes the impaired function and that we have a somatic syndrome and the patients are addressing medical doctors for their problems. And here, in this issue, I follow three German authors that I have published a, to me, very important publication in 2007 in The Lancet 
um, management of functional somatic syndromes, pending the triple and head stroke, three German psychosomaticians, and where they state that the term somatoform disorder or somatization disorder does not really correspond to the medical reality because these patients do not, in the first place, address a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but instead they go and see medical doctors. And the term somatization, if you say that to a patient, he will not like it. It is a problem. So it is a term, a diagnostic term, that is not well liked by the patient, the people that have to identify with it. And mandatory requirements uh, for usable diagnosis have to meet the three criteria at least. They have to be acceptable for patients. It must not, it must not be an of offense to the patients. It must be usable for doctors. We must know what that means, and we must easily be able to use it. And it must have a core theoretical concept. And this is the case with functional somatic syndrome because it has a core theoretical concept based on affect theory, a theory of emotions. Uh, the term functional somatic syndromes has even two other meanings. The first one is, of course, as we have said, the impaired function of the organ. Okay, so far. But we have a second, as important, meaning of this term, that the symptom has a very important and specific psychodynamic meaning for the patient. It has a very important function for the inner balance of the patient, why he has this symptom, and how he's dealing with this symptom, and what relief he gets from having that symptom. If we have a look at the clinical spectrum, what are we talking about when we talk about functional somatic syndrome? Here, too, I follow these three authors because it is a well thought through concept. They differentiate three basic uh, classifications. First one is the syndromes that come with pain. Second one is the syndromes that come with specific organ dysfunction. And the third one is the syndromes that come with a more generalized autonomic dysfunction. And as you will see, all three sections bring a real big patient populations epidemic issues, headache, tension headache. It is a real epidemic. <clears throat> many, many patients are suffering from <coughs> tension headache and migraine. A gigantic epidemic, back pain, upper back pain, lower back pain. And you know that the findings that we see in the CAT scans or in the, in the MRTs do not really, in most cases, correspond to the patient's pain. The whole topic of fibromyalgia, pain in the bones, in the muscles, in the joints, in the tendons, and so on. So just these three uh, stand for a big patient population. And if we have a closer look at the specific syndromes, we can start on top. Many ENT surgeries are full of patients with dizziness, drowsiness, lightheadedness, vertigo, tinnitus, things that really, patients are really suffering from these uh, syndromes, but you don't find an objective um, finding. Cardiopulmonary symptoms, palpitations, thoracic pain, cardiac pain, arrhythmias, hyperventilation. Hypertension is, for long periods of time, just a functional imbalance before the target organ damages occur. Skin, pruritus, seborrhea, sweating, gastrointestinal disorder, difficulties in swallowing, um, 
upper abdominal pain. How many ultrasound procedures? I've carried out masses of ultrasound procedures for patients with functional abdominal pain. No stones in the gallbladder and no ulcer in the, in the stomach, but still one examination after the other. Uh, change between constipation and diarrhea, irritable bowel syndrome, and many sexual uh, problems have just a functional basis, erectile dysfunction or female sexual dysfunction. The most single frequent symptom in the urban population, psychogenic syndrome, is being restless, nervous, tense, irritable. That's the most frequent single symptom in the urban population and it's mirror picture being worn out, tired, exhausted, burnout is also very true. So this is the spectrum of somatization disorders we are confronted with. And round about 30% uh, of these physically ill patients suffer from a depressive syndrome and about 20% from an anxiety syndrome. But still 50%, five in 10, have no emotional, psychological problem in the first place. These, all these syndromes have some, some cues in common. They have a high variability. They change very often in the, in the history of a patient. You have periods of headache and sweating a simultaneous hypertension, that the patient has hyperventilation. After some time, he gets his first period of back pain, upper back pain, lower back pain. Then he changes to depression. So you really have long courses uh, that are based on the same basic problem. We have a high complexity, simultaneous complexity, or subsequent complexity, and we have a high tendency for chronicity. This can go on for years and still six or seven years are necessary until such a patient um, meets the kind of care that could possibly help him. If we have a closer look at epidemiology, I appreciate very much, I don't know if you know that survey, the, the investigation of Heinz Schiebank in Mannheim, the, um, the, the really basic point is that it was carried out by uh, trained and experienced investigators, therapists, and medical doctors. And it was carried out again subsequently over a time span of 25 years. And they found in all these surveys between 10 and 11% of the urban population suffering from these syndromes. in utilization institutions, in clinics or in doctor's practices, the number is higher. You have between 10 and 4 out of the patients that suffer from functional somatic syndromes. There are specialized clinics, for example, in urology, where you have even higher. But still, half of these patients suffer only on the bodily level and they address medical doctors for their somatic problems. If we now have a closer look what that means to the healthcare system, uh, that's a substantial challenge what these patients bring to a healthcare system. We know that these patients have a higher number of physicians than ordinary medically ill patients and they go and see these doctors more often than patients with coronary heart disease for example or diabetes they have more inpatient treatment they come to the emergency room if you've been working in an emergency room you know these patients that come in the middle of the night at two o'clock in the morning with a, an, a terrible attack of heart pain but it is some other kind of problem they have a higher number of technical measures. Sometimes they have several technical measures subsequently because the problem is not solved. They have more inability to work, more unemployment, 
and they have more permanent invalidity. In Germany now, about 40%, nearly every second patient that goes on permanent invalidity is suffering from a psychosomatic or mental disorder. It's incredible. They incur about the double of the costs <coughs> of ordinary medical patients. They um, have a really substantially high claim in, in costs and they do not in the first place uh, address psychiatrists or psychologists, but they come and see medical doctors for their problem. If we now, um, but I think we slowly coming to the end, have a look on effect. Maybe I will just take the next slide and then I'll stop. Uh, the, the core theory, I think, which is the most helpful is the one that is based on effect, which are complex systems that um, consist of a subjective perception, cognitive aspect evaluation, central complex activations, and so on, and of course expression <coughs> in the face and the gesture and the language. And we'll just go through one stepwise pathogenesis in a functional somatic syndrome. We start with the, in this model, in this concept, concept we start with the complete experience where we have the, the pictures, the fantasies, the imaginations, we have the feelings that belong to it, the perceptions. All this belongs to the complete experience. And when what we call defense is coming in, this composition changes. When I'm sitting at a table with my boss, for example, and there's a red apple, and I want the apple, but my boss too, maybe I'd better forget about it. Mm if I don't want to get in trouble. So it can happen when defense comes in that I forget about my wish. But I still have my inner turmoil in myself, so the effect remains as an anxiety. It's a typical anxiety syndrome, acute anxiety. You are full of, of anxiety and fear, but you don't know why. The wish has disappeared. But sometimes this is still too dangerous when I'm confronted with my boss. So the effect can disappear and only my breath and my tachycardia remain, but the effect also disappears. Sometimes that is even still too dangerous and even the somatic effect equivalent can disappear and what remains is a silent hypertension, as an example. And the great advantage of hypertension is Everything is calm, everything is clear, no trouble, no problem, apart from the high pressure inside myself that nobody else is seeing. So this was just some impressions of functional somatic syndromes. Thank you very much for your attention, and now I give the word over to Matthias Borg.